What's up everyone, I'm Chris Cappy, your Average Infantryman, and in this video we're going to be diving into the country of Estonia, its military capabilities, and where it fits into the bigger picture of the NATO organization. They're the far eastern flank for NATO, making them extremely vulnerable to attack. And don't get me wrong, it's unlikely that we'll see tanks rolling into Estonia anytime soon, but we're going to see in today's warfare, there are options for attacks that are worse than bombs and bullets. There have been deep tensions between Estonia and Russia going back hundreds of years, partly because the Baltic state has over 300,000 ethnic Russians living there today. That's a quarter of their population. Those people are all individuals with their own unique thoughts and feelings, but this is important context to keep in mind because it's part of the reason why Estonia was targeted and found itself attacked by a new form of devastating hybrid warfare. In order to understand that, we need to take a look at their historical background. They have a population of 1.3 million people. Estonia is situated in Northeast Europe, bordered by Latvia to the south, the Baltic Sea to the north and west, and it shares its entire eastern border with Russia, with the Estonian capital of Tallinn only about 120 miles from the Russian border. During World War II, Estonia was occupied by both the Soviets and Germans multiple times, with the Soviets eventually forcing it to integrate into the USSR, and it did not gain independence until 1990. Constant and continuous occupation and war shaped the historical culture of the Estonian population, and it's been involved in every conflict imaginable from the Vikings and Crusades to Iraq and Afghanistan. The topographical map shows us why Estonia got its shape. Due to the natural geographic features, the forests and hills in the south and the Pipus Sea in the east act as a natural defense and creates two major choke points that any invading force would have to squeeze their whole army through. Ever since Estonia broke ties with the Soviet Union, the international relationship has been shaky at best. Just as important as the capital itself is the strategic warm water port that feeds into the Baltic Sea. When the USSR was dissolved, Russia lost most of its ports. Sergei Kragnogov wrote a prophetic article in 1991 envisioning that Russia would sooner or later need to get in or break in if they remained locked out of these ports. This guy Kragnogov would end up going on to becoming presidential advisor to none other than Vladimir Putin himself. Something I'm trying to be mindful of as I make these videos in the future is to not make a straw man argument out of Russia or China. In the past few videos, I've taken some cheap shots at their countries, and I have to admit it was me being lazy, and there's no excuse for that. I think the question can boil down to one thing that you can ask yourself. Do you believe Estonia has the right to be a sovereign country that can make their own laws and choose their own allies, or do you believe that Russia's security concerns should supersede Estonia's independence? So I want to give a big thank you to the sponsor of this video, Age of Origins. It's a completely free, amazing tower defense game. It came at the perfect time for me because I was just trying to find where I could find a low stress, fun game like this. Age of Origins is a hybrid zombie tower defense game where you've been given command of a city in a post-apocalyptic world ruled by zombies. My favorite part is the tower defense mini game that you can play. In it, you can use over the top towers like machine guns, rockets, lasers, EMPs, you can even treat some of the zombies and make them fight for you. I was able to recruit unique units that are specifically designed to fight off crazy zombies like mutant zombies, zombie bears, death mothers, gigantuum zombies, and much more. You can expand your city, research technology, and create diplomatic ties with other players. Just be careful in the world map. There could be enemy invasions and epic battles with hundreds of units at any moment. Please consider heading down to the special link in the description to receive an exclusive $60 gift and download Age of Origins. Now I need to let you know ahead of time that I don't agree with this next theory, but in order for us to have a more sophisticated understanding of the situation in Estonia, we need to look at the Russian perspective. If Estonia provokes Russia by buying new anti-air missile systems or increasing hosting military exercises in their country, then they get more lucrative NATO and EU funding. By making it seem like they're at constant threat of being invaded, they can increase the flow of funding to their country. Keep this in mind here. In 2020, Estonia spent $687 million on defense. That's 2.2% of their total GDP. This year, President Biden approved $180 million in defense money to be sent by the US to Estonia, which makes up $11 million more dollars compared to last year. That's a huge amount of money for them. And a lot of it ends up going back into their economy and creating new jobs. I'm not saying I agree with this analysis, 
but I felt like I've been doing a very two-dimensional look at things lately and I wanted to include this possibility. So on the other hand of the argument, Estonia is one of the smallest nations in the world and to accuse them of playing that kind of defense game is extremely unfair to them. The war in Ukraine is plenty of evidence of how real the threat to Estonia is. Russia has also had its hands in facilitating a number of problems for modern Estonia, such as several instances of espionage and kidnapping of government officials by Russia FSB agents. The most prominent instance of this came in the form of a cyber attack in 2007, after the decision by the capital city of Tilan to move the statue of a Soviet soldier out of the city limits to a military cemetery, the ethnic Russian population held riots. Now the bronze soldier statue is a Red Army uniform. To some, it's a positive symbol of the Soviet victory in World War II and a piece of history, while to others, it's a symbol of 50 years of Soviet occupation and oppression of Estonia. Hmm, why does this story sound familiar to me? Didn't something very similar happen with monuments in the US just a few years ago? It's important for me to point out here so that we have both sides of the story, that Russia completely denies having any part in this attack. They claim that it was just people being patriotic and taking matters into their own hands. The point is there's strongly held opinions in Estonia about how to interpret that monument, how to interpret history. Critics say that the Russian media saw an opportunity and manipulated the story, used it to stoke division, where there were even violent riots about the moving this statue. One person was killed, dozens were injured in these riots, and billions of dollars of economic damage. That's how intensely held these beliefs are in Estonia, because whether you see the Soviet Union as a savior from Germany or an oppressive ruler is tied to many people's very identities. In some ways, the world is now struggling with these unanswered questions that were left over from World War II. We're all continuing to fight the spirit of a war that most of us weren't even alive for. In the midst of this, Russian-aligned hacker groups conducted a series of cyber attacks targeting everything from popular news sites to entire Estonian banking systems. To start, it was the first recorded organized cyber attack from one nation against the government of another, something that might almost be seen as mundane these days, but was historic at the time. Secondly, it showed that cyber attacks could be launched and cripple parts of a nation without a single shot fired, meaning you could achieve military objectives like blocking communications, logistics, and support networks without firing a single shot or causing an entire war. Lastly, it showed how Russia uses its ethnic populations in other nations, of which Estonia has a large portion of, in order to take advantage and give cause for it, that kind of attack. This was the exact reasoning the Russia used to annex Crimea. And to this day, Estonia holds the main center of NATO cybersecurity and continually leads research in the cyber realm. I know I have zero chance of stopping war, but I do have a chance of helping educate future troops to have more empathy for the kind of problems that other countries face on both sides of a conflict. Estonia has 6,700 active duty soldiers with 3,200 of those being conscripts. But recent studies have shown that 90% of Estonians agree with conscription and think that it's necessary. There's a major cultural difference in attitude towards mandatory service in some European countries than compared to the United States. Now, since Estonia is part of NATO, it has based its military training and organization off of Western militaries like the United States, and it organizes its ground forces almost identical to the US Army Brigade combat team model, with brigade-sized elements operating as self-sustained independent units. The land forces are split up into two infantry brigades, one light and one mechanized, meaning one using vehicles. Within each brigade are artillery, anti-air, and logistical support battalions. The $786 million that they spend each each year on defense needs to be spent in a really strategic, smart way. This focus on mechanized infantry instead of light infantry allows their military to remain flexible and rapidly respond to any emergency as quickly as possible without their organic vehicles. The land forces intentionally keep their army units undermanned during peacetime in order to keep the cost of military spending low with pre-designated reserve personnel that would quickly fill the empty roles in the event of armed conflict. One of the worst things about the legacy of the Soviet Union in Estonia is that when their troops left in the 90s, they dumped hundreds of thousands of tons of jet fuel into the land. They left all kinds of unexploded ordnance, toxic chemicals, they destroyed the land there, they destroyed all the bases that they left. I found this old government report that details all of this destruction. 
They're still trying to fix it to this day. The Estonia Air Force is small and has the mission set that differs greatly from most larger Western militaries, consisting of only a small number of unarmed aircraft, only two of them being jets. They primarily serve as a detection aircraft that conducts border patrols, attempting to detect any breaches in the Estonian airspace and providing early warning to neighboring countries. The Navy of Estonia is similarly small with a handful of patrol and support vessels. Primarily, they serve in the role of the Coast Guard, patrolling the Northern Ocean coast. While this might seem like a, a large concern for outsiders, it's not quite that for the Estonian themselves. Large modern naval forces are eye-wateringly expensive and used to project force far away from the nation that owns the navy. If you're Estonia and your biggest threat is your next door neighbor, there really isn't much of a need to extend your influence too much. Now, because Estonia is a small country, you might think the cards are completely stacked against them. Ah, but you would be wrong. Estonia has a unique unified paramilitary force, the Estonia Defense League that functions similarly to the U.S. National Guard and trains as an independent fighting force. They're tasked with defending key Estonian territory during wartime. Believe it or not, because the Defense League is so cheap, it is the largest standing combat formation in the entire Baltic state region of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, with a whopping 25,500 members. In a war, this would play out with the active duty army conducting complex attacks on enemy formations while the League would set up defenses around town and major roadways. Unlike Ukraine, the Estonian border is much more built up with usable infrastructure and more railheads and port areas that Russia would be able to utilize for maneuver and logistics purposes, things that they were not able to do with Ukraine. Similarly, it would be much easier for Russia to use a surprise invasion because of how closely established Russian military bases are already at that border. It'd be hard to tell the difference between a large buildup of invasion forces versus just normal training operations. Not only that, but the Estonia capital is much, much closer and would be very vulnerable to naval attacks because of its coastal location. As of now, Estonia lacks any anti-ship missile capabilities. Estonia obviously knows this and counters it in a few ways. The first way is a trilateral partnership with the other Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. Through several treaties and agreements, militaries of one nation have near full freedom to maneuver through another. Troops that are assigned to defend Estonia are often called the Atlantic speed bump because they would be the ones that had to slow down Russian forces, not fully stop them. Ah, cryptic army humor, my favorite. Add on to this the fact that they're purchasing air defense systems, self-propelled artillery, and anti-tank munitions shows that the Estonian military is truly transforming itself into an even more formidable fighting force. Hopefully it doesn't just get stuck up and think it's too cool to hang out with us after getting all this Gucci gear. The future of Estonia is clearly not only important to the United States, but the EU and Russia as well. It tells us that the future of warfare is going to include a whole new category of weapons that aren't just rifles and bombs. And how to defend against that is something that remains to be seen.